Hello friends, welcome back to part 23 of my Tesla Forecast video review series. My co-host Loki is on assignment in Damascus. Uh, so let's get right back to it where we left off. Now in the last video we did not cover a lot of ground, but in this video we are going to cover a lot of ground. So the previous video covered uh, just these topics. And we're going to cover a lot more in the next section because a lot of this information is just repeated from what we've seen already up top. So uh, here I've got automotive sales excluding regulatory credits. So this is just a breakout the same way that Tesla reports it now with regulatory credits revenue on its own line. And the rest of this is just the same. Automotive leasing, energy, services, another total revenue. I'm going to try to remember to make a video about leasing accounting, which is a little bit different than cash delivery accounting, and explain that because a couple of people have asked about it. And in the next section, you don't need a line for regulatory credit cost of sales because the number is so small, it might not even round to 0.001 billion, so you just leave it in automotive cost of sales however much that is, just some processing and paperwork expense associated with selling regulatory credits, probably, little contracts, uh, signing, little legal allocation, maybe, something like that. All right, so uh, this section gives you non-GAAP earnings, and then uh, stock comp has its own line here for total stock compensation for the entire company regardless of which kind of group it would fall in. So some of the stock comp would fall into automotive cost of sales. Uh, some would fall into uh, services and other, some into R&D, some into SG&A, right? So here it is all separated out, and there's the gap earnings number as reported by Tesla. So as reported meaning that it is burdened with the cost of stock compensation as though it were a cash expense, even though stock compensation is not a cash expense. It's the difference between the non-GAAP and the GAAP uh, earnings numbers because Wall Street doesn't care about that non-cash expense, so they throw it out. But GAAP accounting does care because they're more interested in making sure that the GAAP earnings numbers are comparable between companies that don't give out any stock compensation and companies that do. They want to make your earnings look as though you paid your employees all cash, no stock uh, compensation, so that it's a fair, uh, as fair a comparison as you can get at, at the gap earnings line. Hope that makes sense. Then, in a few of the early videos in this series, we looked at how Tesla makes and then spends its average dollar of revenue. So here's the section where I uh, calculate those numbers. So in this first section, I'm just looking at uh, this column only. So it's just saying, hey, this is our total revenue number. So the total amount of money paid to Tesla by customers uh, in this quarter was $24 billion. Of that, $20.269 billion was automotive sales excluding regulatory credits. So this is how I get to, for example, how many pennies regulatory credit sales are. Well, if you just look up here, it's doing the, the same kind of thing. They're all dividing into the total revenue number because that's the number we have chosen as our index. Um, what is the total amount of revenue Tesla has collected? And then how big are each of these amounts relative to that largest number on the income statement? So yeah, regulatory credit sales down at, you know, one and a half percent is what that looks like to me. And if I were to take this decimal out, we could see that it's, yeah, 1.48 cents. So I get, I, I win the prize for doing mental math and figuring out that that was almost one and a half cents. Then uh, these have to add up to 100 cents every time in every quarter because 
They are just um, telling you what their contribution to total revenue is, and these are comprehensive collectively. So between these regular between these revenue groups, all of Tesla's revenue has been accounted for. So it must add up to 100. Then in the section where we see how Tesla spends its average dollar of revenue, some of the money goes unspent, and that unspent revenue is profit, uh, which we're showing two different ways. We're showing the non-GAAP earnings and the GAAP earnings, and we're also showing that stock compensation is two cents uh, of every dollar of revenue-ish, somewhere in that neighborhood. The largest cost is the automotive cost of sales, the costs of making the cars that people buy from Tesla or lease. So that's this section. The next section does the same thing except it's doing it on a 12 trailing month basis. So we saw in our previous video what a 12 trailing month basis does. This is adding up columns S through V. So over the four quarters, including the most recent one, how much was this cost as a percentage of the total revenue? And you see similar numbers here, but they're smoother because the 12 trailing month average helps to smooth out any seasonality in this number. So maybe Q1 is your worst quarter. If so, when you look at it on a quarterly, individual quarter basis, you'll always see that Q1 looks worse than the other quarters do, depending on what you're charting. Uh, sometimes you'll be able to see clearly, oh, Q1 is a low quarter, if that's the, the problem with your uh, industry's seasonality. But when you do a 12 trailing month basis, every time you're reporting it, you get exactly one Q1, one Q2, one Q3, and one Q4 added together in your mix, and each quarter you're just dropping the oldest one and adding the most recently reported one. So that smooths that out by always representing a contiguous uh, full year of activity. So that's what's going on in this section. These are actually the numbers that are on the charts, the 12 trailing month versions, because it, it looks less jagged on the chart. It does less hopping around when you smooth it uh, for 12 trailing months. And this next section is a bonus treat just for you, uh, YouTube viewer of this uh, video series, as a reward for having made it this far into the series. You get to see information that I didn't even include in my forecast thread. So if I go back, I wonder what I left this on. Let's find out. So if I go back to my bookmarks, and I go back to this thread, and I scroll down past, tweet number 25 of my 30 tweet thread, uh, you'll see that I skip straight to row 1492 here, even though the last thing I showed you was row 1440. So you're getting bonus content right now, uh, seeing what's in between that I left out, and it's this stuff. Uh, it's a non-GAAP operating expense check figure section. So I've gone through to make sure that my non-GAAP operating expense number is right by tying it out a different way than I did previously. So there's the stock compensation, there's the non-GAAP operating expense if you include stock-based compensation, there's the portion shown in cost of sales, there's the portion of OPEX that includes the stock-based compensation that belongs there because uh, Stock-based compensation and cost of sales belongs in gross margin, not in operating expense. Then you adjust for the interest income, the other income or expense net. You add back the net income or loss attributable to non-controlling interests and other, and that gets you to a gap OPEX number, which is the sum of these lines, and you can compare that against this number, which is W1186. Let's run up the page. Okay, here it is. Total operating expenses as we saw in the income statement that we reviewed uh, way, way back in part. I can't even tell you which part number that was when we finally got to the income statement. Uh, so that's what this section does. It's a good idea to have check figures 
So I'll run right back down to row 14, whatever this was. Okay, so we made it to here, 1483. There's a few more lines here that are hidden before we get to uh, the next section that was actually tweeted out in my thread. And this is cost of sales percentage by income statement line item. So we've got automotive sales, including credits here. We've got leasing and resale revenue, cost of sales percentage. And the weighted average of these is what gives us total automotive revenue. And the reason it's always uh, much closer to the automotive sales, including credits number, is because that's the vast majority of deliveries. So it's heavily weighted towards this. Um, in fact, they all show the exact same number. Okay, so here, here's one where they're different. So the weighted average was just a little bit below that number in this quarter and in this quarter. Okay, just showing you it's doing the right math. Okay, so that brings us to energy generation and storage. Uh, this was a huge improvement from Q1 to Q2. Um, I'm not expecting that to sustain in Q3, uh, but I am uh, hoping that we see a better number by Q4, and then that this uh, becomes a much more profitable area for Tesla as they iron out their cell supply issues, ramp up mega pack production at their new mega pack facility, etc. So hopefully energy generation and storage gets a lot better. And then service is another. Uh, sometimes makes a tiny amount of money, sometimes loses a tiny amount of money. Uh, not the most important uh, division of Tesla. Uh, never going to make a ton of money for Tesla, but hopefully makes a little as time goes by which leaves us with the total uh, for the revenue generating operations, uh, cost of sales. All right. And the next section is included in my Tesla forecast, and it's the total cost of sales percentages by site and by product. Uh, so these all uh, have, have been reviewed previously in the forecast review series, but I do have all of it together in one neat little package here also with total cost of sales percentages by site which is helpful for understanding stuff like hey James you keep saying Shanghai is more profitable than Fremont well yeah in in my model it's you know 10 or 12 points uh, more favorable um, than Fremont is and uh, expect that to continue going forward even as Fremont uh, gets more cost uh, efficient uh, Shanghai also will so uh, there were some uh, idle charges that hit Q2, as well as the factory just being at lower production capacity with the Shanghai lockdowns in Q2, accounting for that higher than typical number for them. Then you can see for the ramp ups of Berlin and Texas, that early in the ramp you lose money, and then as that ramp proceeds, uh, you start to make more and more money. The lower your cost of sales percentage goes, the more gross margin you can deliver uh, as the ramp uh, scales up production. And then for uh, products like Cybertruck and Semi, we are hopeful that we will see some production of uh, Semi at the end of this year, maybe a very small number indeed. Uh, and then for Cybertruck to start ramping the middle of next year, maybe we'll get lucky and have a few deliveries in Q2 of 2023. And then hopefully that product uh, ramps up speedily from there. And then I've got regulatory credits cost of sales percentage in here as a really, really tiny cost of sales percent. And you can see here the difference between total automotive cost of sales percent and automotive cost of sales percent excluding regulatory credits is a pretty decent chunk of change here. Uh, so that's what's going on in this section. Then for non-automotive, these are the energy division products. So here's where we see Megapack ramping up and doing better over time. Power Wall, I expect, will do better over time as well. And solar roofs and solar panels hopefully will improve. Uh, if not, we will uh, monitor and adjust this forecast as uh, necessary 
to uh, to make it a, as reasonable a forecast as we can come up with. And that gets you the total cost of sales percentage. Then in the next section, I said we were going to cover a lot in this video. In the next section, it's just one minus the cost of sales percentage to give you the gross margins for each of these products by site and by product. So that's what all of these are doing. If you see a negative number, that means the cost of sales is more than 100% on that product in that quarter. But the gross margin is improving. So 26.2 was not the start of a downward trend, as uh, some members of Tesla Q would have you believe, uh, but rather uh, a one-off that will reverse right away and should become more and more profitable into the future. Maybe surpassing 40% gross margin at some point. Maybe the end of next year, maybe 2024. Depends how well the, uh, the full self-driving progress goes, really, which is very, very hard to predict. And that gets us to total gross margin percent, and that is where I will end this video at row 1564, having covered a few hundred rows worth of my detailed forecast model. And with that, I'll say, if you've enjoyed today's video, click the like button. Uh, if you're not subscribed to my channel, why not go ahead and uh, subscribe to my channel. And click that alert bell to get notified when I post fresh content. That all uh, really helps out my YouTube channel, and it's all free to you, dear viewer. And I will see you in the next one.